All right, let's mess around with some matrices in Python. Uh, you will remember there is the array function in the NumPy package that we use to make vectors, and it turns out that we're going to use the same function to make matrices. Uh, here is your cheat sheet for this episode. Uh, here's the array function that I'm calling here, and notice that I've got a number of different punctuation items here uh, that you have to make sure all line up. So notice that before we said array, and then we had bananas, and inside the bananas we had only one pair of boxes, which had all of the vectors elements uh, comma separated inside. Now what we're doing is we're saying that inside this outer pair of boxes, we have three inner pairs of boxes, and the inner pairs of boxes are separated by commas themselves. And that is making a matrix with these as the rows. So you'll notice that the way Python knows when we want to stop talking about one row and start talking about the next one is when the inner one uh, ends. And this kind of aligns with our intuition, right, about the fact that in uh, math, uh, a row of a matrix really is a vector, right? And so we're basically building a matrix out of a number of different row vectors that we list all one after the other, all right? There's other ways, too, uh, to make matrices. We have the zeros function we talked about before. Now, shape is going to turn out to be something that Python, uh, especially the NumPy package, lets us use. We're using it here to specify the shape of the vector. So we know we want an all-zero matrix if we're calling zeros. This tells us we want it to be 7 by 4. Notice that there's no... Uh, nothing outside these bananas here. These bananas indicate that this is a tuple, and that tuple is telling us what the dimensions are of the matrix we want. And similarly, we're doing a, a same kind of thing here. We're saying random.rand, and that is going to give us a matrix with random entries between 0 and 1, as we saw also with the uh, uh, with vectors. And this time we're just doing it with the matrix, and we're specifying the dimensions of the matrix. Now, if I have a matrix that's called A, and I don't know how big it is, I can find out by saying A dot shape. And then if I say A dot shape of zero or A dot shape of one, I'm essentially accessing this same tuple that I used to make it, for instance, if I made it with the zeros function. Um, and this is basically giving me the number of rows and the number of columns that it has. Now, a thing we're gonna wanna do a lot, obviously, is get the entries out of a matrix. And the simplest way to do that is to specify the row and the column number that you want, and that will give you the element there. Remember that Python starts numbering the rows and the columns at zero, not at one, which, by the way, is why we had a zero and a one here instead of a, uh, a one and a two, because the actual elements of the tuple that specifies the dimensions also begins at zero. And that's true of the rows and columns as well. Now, Python has a little shortcut here. NumPy uh, has a shortcut where we can put a colon in place of a row number or column number, in which case we're getting all of the rows for that column or all of the columns for that row. So this one right here says, please give me all the rows, column number nine. This says, says give me row number four, all of the columns. And so that's a nice way to sort of slice and dice a matrix to get part of it out. Uh, there's transpose that does exactly what we learned about earlier in this episode. The dot dot function is uh, what we used before when we did dot product of two vectors. That is exactly the same operator that we're going to use for our matrix vector multiplication. Note, by the way, that for this to work, I've discovered that x has to be a matrix, not a vector. So what we're going to do is make x a n by 1 vector, or excuse me, matrix, n by 1 matrix, in order for this matrix vector multiplication to work. So it's still matrix vector multiplication in principle, but uh, operationally, x is not actually a vector. It's actually a one-column matrix. And then we learned the load text function last time that allows us to read data from a file. Same thing here. We're going to specify the delimiter, which is what separates the items in a particular row from each other. And a lot of times we're dealing with um, data that is comma separated. And what that means is that each row of the file is a row of the matrix. And then the individual elements of a row that are in each column uh, are separated by commas, and we'll see uh, an example of that. So that's the, the first big thing to learn uh, in this segment is these matrix operations, and we'll play around with those. The second thing to learn, uh, I'll come back to in a second, but it's actually a bigger deal, and it has to do with the programming toolbox that all programs use. Again, if you have used uh, any language, Python or anything else, for programming before, then this will be old hat to you, and you'll just have to learn the syntax. If you haven't, then you know you got to sort of hold on here. It's, it's, it's 
kind of or packing a wallop with this syntax and all it can do. But basically what we're doing is allowing us to write a program which will conditionally execute certain code. We're basically saying if certain things are true, please run this code or else don't do anything or perhaps or else run this other code instead. So it's a way of branching is the name that we use for that in programming. And if you've never done programming before, you'll see it. It makes sense. It's basically a decision that the program makes as it goes along and says, hey, I'm either going to execute this block of code or I'm not uh, based on whether this condition is true or not. OK, and uh, one of the things that you will see, and I, again, I've, I've, I've been quite uh, anal and obsessed with these indentation things, uh, and I will continue to be so because Python is absolutely inflexible there. You must have all of the statements that are in the block of code you want to conditionally execute tabbed over or spaced over. And then once you have a statement that is not spaced over anymore, you're signaling to Python that you are now done with the if statement and you're back ready to code that you always want to execute, not only sometimes. And then, as I mentioned, there's this if here. Uh, and another form of this is to have an if else, in which case you're saying, if the condition is true, I want to execute these statements. Otherwise, I want to execute this other group of statements. And whenever you have an if else, it's always going to execute these statements in the first part or the second part. Never both, and also never neither one. One last thing, as long as we're on this slide, I'll just go ahead and uh, talk about this. The condition is where you're specifying under what circumstances you want to execute the conditional code. And basically, there's some easy ones that are easy to figure out, like less than, greater than. You can say, if x is greater than 5, then do these things. Less than, equal to, we specify that with two uh, characters in a row there because there isn't a less than with a line under it symbol on your keyboard so we just accomplished that with two different uh, symbols back to back this one absolutely stings beginners and so get used to it equal the way you do equal to in python or most languages actually is you use a double equal sign it will not work if you use a single equal sign so just remember whenever you're doing an if always use a double equal for comparison if you want to compare whether two things are not equal, you use the bang equals here, uh, which is two uh, characters again. And then sometimes we'll use and and or, which are logical operators. We want to say, hey, if this is true and this is true, then I want to execute this block of code. Or maybe we want to say, if this is true or this is true or both, we want to execute this block of code. And that's what we use the and and the or for. All right, so let's get started. Uh, let's load up spider here. And first, we'll just do some stuff down here in the uh, little inspector thing. So I'm going to make an array. Actually, first, got to uh, import my numpy thing. So let's make an array called A. Again, we usually use capital letters for that. Uh, and we'll make a matrix. And I'm going to make it be 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 7. And if I do that and I say print A, we'll see that it made a nice 3 by 2 matrix here for us. Uh, if I wanted to say print a dot transpose, it would transpose the thing and we will turn the rows into columns and the columns equal rows. Uh, I could use the zeros function. Maybe I'll make a vector or a matrix called Z and I'll say I want it to be zeros. I want the shape to be a, uh, we'll make it a four by five. How's that? And if we do that, we'll see that they're all zeros there. We can also say random. So if I say random dot rand and maybe I want it to be a three by six we'll get a bunch of values which are between zero and one. So again, if I want a different range, I could do something like multiply by 10, then they'll be between zero and nine, or between zero and 10 rather. Uh, I could round that or truncate that. Uh, and then they will all be integers. Uh, and in that particular case, I didn't get any zeros, but I certainly could. So if I want them to be from one to 10 instead of from zero to nine, uh, I could add one to it, right? So this is the same, uh, thing that we've done before with vectors, uh, all we're doing now is we're getting an entire matrix worth of them. And it works just like that. All right, so let's go back to our uh, A matrix here. Again, if I say I want 0, 1, that tells me I'd like the element at row 0, column 1, please. Remember, row 0 is the first row, and column 1 is the second column, weirdly, uh, if you're not used to it. And so that has the value 4. I can say, um, let's take A of 1, 2. And it'll say, sorry, you can't do that because there is no column two. I could, of course, say a two one, uh, and that would give me the seven. I could say a dot transpose one two uh, because that will first take the transpose of a, uh, and then give me element at column uh, two row one. 
uh, and it works like that. And then as I mentioned, we can always do this. We can say, I want all the rows, please, column one. And that will give me uh, the vector back for six and seven. Or I can say, I'd like, uh, I'd like row two. Um, oops. And I'd like all of the columns. Uh, that gives me the bottom row here, right? Now, uh, let's do some vector matrix multiplication. So there's my A. Uh, I'm going to make an X, and again, I'm going to turn this into a uh, matrix. I'm going to say, uh, let's make a 5 and a 2. So by doing it that way, notice that I've made a column vector. Uh, no, I haven't. I made a row vector. My bad. Uh, what I meant to do was say, make the first row be 5 and the second row be 2. So notice how I did that, right? If I do this, then I'm saying, give me just one row that has 5, 2 in it. Here I'm saying, give me one row that has just five, and then another row that has just two. And the uh, effect of that uh, is to give me a, uh, a column matrix here, right? So then I can say a dot x, uh, and that does the uh, operation that we learned uh, about. There's a and there's x, and so if you work that out and say um, three times five plus four times two, uh, that gives me 23, and 5 times 6, uh, or 5 times 5 plus 6 times 2 gives me 37, and 1 times 5 plus 7 times 2 uh, gives me 19, uh, and so it performs the, uh, the operation like that, right? And of course, if my x was not the right size, like if I said, uh, let's make this 3 tall, we'll make a 7 there as well, uh, so now x looks like that. Uh, now, if I tried to say a dot x, uh, it'll tell me, whoa, 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 can't do that. Uh, because we know that in order to have a meaningful matrix vector multiplication, we have to make sure that the number of columns in the matrix is the same as the number of rows in the vector or the number of elements in the vector, right? Okay, uh, let's do the load text thing as well. So um, I have this file right here called thing.txt, and it is full of uh, numeric entries. And what I've got is, you know, obviously a four by three matrix here is essentially what's in this file. Again, this is not a Python file. This is just a file, which you could read with any language, uh, including Python. And what I'm going to do down here is I'm going to say, let's make a, uh, a B variable. And we're going to say load text. And we're going to say we want to load from thing.txt. And we're going to say that the delimiter I'd like you to use is a comma. And when I do that, then I get back B. And it looks just as we expected up here, right? All right, now let's do a little bit of programming, and this is where we're going to have to do some deeper thinking than just that experimental stuff, right? So here's what I want to do. We talked about some special matrices, right? It could be uh, diagonal or symmetric or square or stuff like that. I want to write some functions which will return true or false based on whether or not the matrix in question satisfies those criteria, all right? So let's do a square first. Here's what I'm going to do. It's a good Python style, really good style in any language to name such a function is. So I'm going to make one called is square. And again, uh, we're passing it the name of the parameter. So we can call is square and pass it any matrix we choose. But this function is going to name whatever matrix we give it A. So we're going to refer to it in A in here. And if you think about it, a square matrix, really what you have to do is you just have to figure out are the number of rows equal to the number of columns. And that's just totally uh, tailor-made for an if statement. So here's what we're going to do. If, and the way we figure out the number of rows is a dot shape of zero. Again, we're going to say equal, equal. You have to say two equals there. If that equals to shape dot one, well then we have a square matrix. And what we're going to do in that case is return true. And that's how you spell true in Python. It's T-R-U-E with a capital T. All the rest are lowercase. And then we'll say else colon return false. It's a very simple little function, should be handy for us. Let's run that thing. And again, when you press the arrow, all that does is load your code. That does not actually call the function. What we have to do is say is square b, and the answer is false because uh, b is a 4 by 3, not a 3 by 3. Um, we have, let's make a Joe here, and we'll set that equal to, let's make a zeros matrix. Uh, and we will say that its shape uh, is, we'll make it a two by two, uh, and it looks like that. And so if we say is square Joe, uh, it returns us the answer true, right? So it's a nice handy function that we can always use anytime we want to find out if we've got a square matrix, we just call is square. All right, let's move on to a little bit harder one. Let's find out whether or not a matrix is diagonal. So remember, a diagonal matrix is one in which 
all of the elements except possibly the ones on the diagonal, which is the upper left to bottom right uh, slanty thing, all of the elements other than possibly the diagonal are zero. So this is where you have to kind of think it through and what you'll discover as you think it through, and I'm gonna kind of, it's, it's a little bit advanced here if you haven't done any programming before, but, but follow along, I think you'll get it. Remember we learned this pattern with the for loop. We can say for i, or actually I'm gonna use r right now for reasons I'll explain in a second. For r in range of um, uh, a dot shape of zero. So the reason I'm using R is because R stands for row. And so what I'm gonna do here is go through all of the row numbers of the matrix inside my loop. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have another for loop inside there where I go through all of the column numbers. Now the thing to, that you gotta understand here is that when I do this pattern, every single combination of a valid row number and a valid column number are going to be encountered. In fact, if we put a print statement in here, and we say, I'm on row R and column C. Uh, and we just run this. So right now, all I'm doing is printing the row numbers and column numbers. I'm not printing anything to do with A here, right? If we run this thing, uh, let's see what happens. I'm going to say is diagonal, uh, and we'll pass it Joe. And what it does is it says, I'm on row zero, column zero, row zero, column one, row one, column zero, row one, column one. Because for each possible value of R, it ran the entire inner loop, which went through all the column numbers and did the print statement. So we do all the row one stuff, or row zero stuff rather, and then all of the row one stuff. And if we did the same thing with uh, B, we'll see that it gives us row one, column or excuse me, row zero, column zero, row zero, column one, row zero, column two, and then it does all the columns for row one, all the columns for row two, all the columns for row three. So there's a very common pattern in programming where you say, I wanna go through all the elements of a matrix, I need to examine each one for something, and we'll talk about what that something is in a second, and then only after that am I going to uh, want to perhaps return an answer. And so this nested for loop is what that's called, where you have a for loop inside a for loop is, a, is able to run through all the combinations of row numbers and column numbers here, right? Let's change our print so that instead of printing the row number and column number uh, only, I also print um, the, the value of the matrix itself. So that's gonna be RC, right? So now I'm using variable names instead of actual numbers, and this is gonna print out the uh, value of the matrix there, right? So if I say is diagonal B, uh, it did this, oh, I forgot my stir, right? I always forget that. Uh, most programming languages do not require that, but Python does. You wanna print something out in a print statement that is a number. All right, let's do it again. Uh, what did I do wrong? Did not contain a loop with a signature matching. Uh, did I, in fact, save that? Oh, unexpected EOF, okay, uh, I've got some board code here. Uh, what did I do? A of R, C, oh, I forgot my uh, closing banana, right, sorry about that, right. So I had the closing banana for this stir, but I didn't have the big closing banana that goes with the print. Okay, once more with feeling. It says the value at 0, 0 is 11, the value at 0, 1 is 46, et cetera, and let's just make sure that's true, and it is. Uh, and the last row gave us 3, 2, 1, which is just what we want here. Okay, now, method to my madness, why did I do that? It's certainly not because I really want this function to print a bunch of stuff, I don't. But what I wanna do is ask myself the question, is the matrix diagonal? And here's the key insight to understand. Whether or not something's diagonal comes down to the fact that maybe or maybe not, every single element of the matrix satisfies a certain property. If there's any one element that's out of whack, we're gonna ditch this diagonal business and say, no, we're not diagonal. So what we're gonna do as we go through all of the different elements here is we're gonna say, if we are have a, have a non-zero where we should have a zero, then return false. And so the way we're gonna write that is, uh, if A of RC is not equal to zero, that would mean we have a non-zero at row R and, row, and column C. Now, of course, that's okay if we're on the diagonal. So what we wanna do here is say, and R bang equals C. So if you stare at this, you'll realize what this is saying in English is, 
if we're not on the diagonal, because remember the diagonal is where the row number and the column number are equal. So if we're not on the diagonal and it's not a zero, whoa, that's trouble. That means we are not a diagonal matrix. And at that point we can say we're out of here, the answer is false. So remember, as soon as you encounter a return statement, that means you are done, D-O-N-E, done with the function, and it completely stops, terminates, aborts, and returns the answer false. Now, let me tell you how not to write the rest of this function, and this is the number one way programmers mess this up, is they will say, well, if that's true, return false, else return true. And that looks so right, because it looks like you're saying, well, gosh, if I have a non-zero entry on the diagonal, or on the non-diagonal part of the matrix, uh, then I'm going to return false. Otherwise, I'm going to return true. What else could be more natural, right? But we'll discover this does not work. Uh, and let's see why. So uh, we had Bob, and uh, no, we didn't have Bob. We had, uh, I forget what we had. Let's make a new matrix. Let's make it Bob. Uh, and let's make it uh, be um, uh, 3, 0, and then 0, 2. So Bob looks like that. That's clearly diagonal. So if I say, is diagonal Bob? It comes back and says true, so that's a good sign. Here's the problem though. Let's say I make row zero column one a five. So now Bob looks like this. Clearly it is not diagonal anymore, yet we're still gonna get a true here, okay? And here's why. What this is doing is it's saying, let's look at the first element and see whether it's okay. If it's not, return false. So far, so good. But if it's okay, then let's just assume blindly, optimistically, that the whole rest of the matrix is okay. We're saying if the first element is okay, we're gonna say the whole matrix is legit. In reality, we have no business saying this matrix is legit until we've gone through all the elements and none of them had a problem. So what we have to do is not make this an if else, but instead do this. We're gonna say, this goes all the way out here. Here's why. I need to run through the entire nested for loop, looking through every single element of this matrix. And if I find a single non-zero off the diagonal, I'm gonna return false. But if I make it to line 19, if I survive this far, that must be because I went through all of the entries in the matrix and none of them violated what I needed them not to violate. And at that point, I can say return true. So notice we're only gonna get here if I never prematurely aborted the operation by finding a, a, a messed up value. And so now this should work. If I say, hey, is diagonal Bob false? If I put this back and say uh, Bob zero zero uh, equals uh, zero, then it should be true. Um, and you can play around with that and see that that works, right? Okay, now last one uh, we'll do is we're gonna say, uh, let's see whether or not the matrix is symmetric. And remember, symmetric means that every row column uh, is the same as the column row. In other words, uh, I didn't say that very well. But so if um, row two, column five is a three, then that means row five, column two is a three, right? Those have to be the same for every single pair of entries. So it turns out that it's gonna be the same format as the loop we just did with diagonal, right? We're gonna to want to go through every single element of the matrix, making sure that it's equal to its opposite, and only once we've gone through all those and haven't found a single exception to the, world, to the rule, only then can we breathe a sigh of relief and say, okay, I'm gonna tell you this thing is symmetric, right? So what we're gonna do is really the same sort of uh, uh, pattern here. In fact, I'm gonna copy this. I'm not copying this blindly. I'm not saying, whoa, I need to start this function, so let me just grab some other function. I'm doing it because we have the same sort of pattern here. The only thing that's gonna be different is this part, right? Um, the part that's in the condition of the if. Because now I need to bail out if a different thing is true. And if you think that through, you'll realize that the condition for this thing not to be symmetric is if ARC is not equal to ACR. If we ever find that for any row and column number, then we can say it's false. Only if we've gone through all of these and they all check out, can we say that it's true. So let's see if that works. Uh, right now we have Bob looking like that. He is symmetric, I think you'll agree. And so let's uh, run that is symmetric Bob. And he says true. Uh, let's change zero, 01 
to be a five as we had it. And let's see if he's symmetric. No, he's not now because clearly he's not reflective across the uh, diagonal. But if we change Bob one zero also equals five and then run this thing, uh, we'll see that it again returns true, all right? So I'm not claiming that by testing it a couple times, we can be confident that it works in all cases. That's sort of a, a something you gain uh, with programming experience. You learn how hard you need to test something and how many different cases do you need to try uh, to make sure you've covered all the bases. Um, but that's what we're gonna do here just to sort of illustrate that principle, right? So thanks for sticking with me. Uh, I will catch you next time on episode five on